Okay. Um, so we'll call. Uh, I'm sorry, Raina. Let me wait till you sit. I'm trying to remember the password. And I, I do apologize to the audience in advance. I hope that you saw um, from the posted agenda that we are going to do a quick executive session up front. And I, I apologize. I know that's awkward for, for the flow of the meeting when you've, when you've just arrived. So I apologize in advance, but it is something that has to get done in the beginning. So I'm sorry. I hope that we posted it with enough time so you could uh, see that. OK. So we'll call the meeting to order at 6.03. And um, can I get a motion to go into the second session? Okay, so can you tell us what it's about so anyone else? Uh, it's personnel, personnel. 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 Okay. <coughs> so. There is a okay. There was a second yeah, from Pamela. Where's Raina? Oh, Thank you, everybody, for waving. I apologize for that. Okay, welcome everybody. Thank you for being here. I apologize to those of you who were not here at the start um, where I made the announcement that we needed to go into executive session at the beginning of the meeting. Thank you. Um, I hope you saw the agenda and, and knew that we were going to do that. Um, yes, we'll do that after public session. Okay, so first, just as a reminder for those of you who were not at our meeting last um, uh, last week, um, <laughs> every week now it seems like. <laughs> um, we have um, a reminder to the board um, you know we're going to continue to to um, uh, you know try and, and keep all of our comments uh, directed at me and I'll, I'll try and help the conversation uh, and debate flow and to the public uh, we made two announcements last month you would have seen or last week you would have seen them in the minutes but just as a reminder for public comments, um, we welcome them and we're glad that you're here. Um, please limit them to two minutes. And secondly, we will now um, we welcome any letters that the public would like to submit to the board. And if you are here to read a letter of your own, welcome and we're glad you're here. But if you're here to read somebody else's letter, we ask that it just be submitted to Raina and it will go in, in public record. Okay? Um, great. Would anybody like to speak? Thank you for having us in Reading. Uh, um, dear Please board. introduce yourself. Oh, Sherry Souza, I'm a resident of Woodstock. So, dear board, I wish to address the discussion that occurred at the last board meeting regarding early release days for next year's calendar. As I left the board meeting on Monday night at 9.30, I saw a classroom with lights on. When I opened the door, I found a teacher whose classroom was prepared for the next day's instruction and a teacher behind the desk. I asked her why she was still here, and she offered that she was correcting papers. She couldn't go home until she was done. I usually arrive at school at 7 a.m. each day. I'm not the first educator in the building. I often leave between 4.30 and 5. I am not the last professional to leave. I reflected on the number of meetings teachers are required to attend each month, including faculty, department, MTSS, action research planning, PLCs, IEP, 504, and EST meetings. Some educators attend department chair meetings. Beyond these meetings, 28 teachers have enrolled in the trauma-informed classroom course that takes place during vacation time. 20 teachers enrolled in a graduate level math course this semester. Educators are engaged in professional work beyond the school day and beyond the contracted time. I then looked at the top schools in our state according to the SBAC data. They include Marion Cross and South Burlington. Both of these have early release times for professional development. We often compare ourselves with Stowe. They have early release time. My husband is an administrator of a K-12 school close to Montpelier with, with, that has 65% free and reduced lunch population. They have seven early release days and better test scores than WCSU. My goal is always to operate with relevant data in front of me when I make important decisions for my students and staff. I hope this letter can provide the board with a broader view of the need and the work that educators are currently doing. Respectfully submitted, Sherry Susan. Thank you, Sherry. Lane? And if you'd please identify yourself for those of you that we don't know. My name is Elaine Lively. I'm from Woodstock. I was disappointed to learn at your meeting last week that the board has adopted another measure that will limit public comment. I urge you to find another man manner for the community to engage with you. As a frequent attendee of your meetings, I appreciate your efforts to keep your sessions brief. 
However, I know that they run long, not because of excessive public comment, but rather because you have an aggressive agenda that includes numerous changes to school composition, educational initiatives, and a potential $68 million bond vote. I suggest that you consider your desire for timely meetings in relation to your desire to successfully achieve your initiatives and goals. During this time of change, you may be better served by increasing rather than decreasing opportunities for public feedback. Thank you. Thank you, Elaine. Yeah. Gene goals were already. As a resident of a district member town, I would like to express concerns and thoughts regarding the current study and proposal for the middle school high school rebuild. I will preface my comments by saying that I did attend one of the walkthrough building tours last week to get a true vision of my own regarding the current conditions and issues with the school. It was obvious to me that the building has many structural and environmental challenges. There is also no doubt that most, if not all, of the issues need to be addressed to meet the dynamic aspects of teaching, learning, safety, sustainability, and energy efficiency. These needs are grand in scale and, of course, grand in cost. Most importantly, I see this issue as so far reaching in scope and cost that it is imperative that the board and the administration move slowly and deliberately to consider all options. While this may sound like I am stating the obvious, from the perspective of a quote unquote outsider to the process, it seems like a common default practice to me is to ensure there is plenty of CYA to go around. I respectfully ask that you consider the following thoughts and actions in your planning going forward. Number one, improve communication with the public. Hasten and enhance every imaginable conduit of communication to fairly gather feedback from all constituents. Not just the newspaper, but posting on front porch forum, listservs, and public bulletin boards when new information is going to be presented or available. Do not assume the public will follow your every step online. Two, be continuously mindful that Woodstock is the largest town in our community and therefore has more voices being heard. It's not the quantity of opinions that matter, it's the diversity and depth of all opinions voice. Three, exhaust every possible funding source, including massive fundraising efforts. This might serve to allow those with more wealth who support the project to minimize and minimize taxpayer burden, especially taxpayers who are already having to make difficult choices regarding daily living needs. Finally, four, query all taxpayers in every member town to determine how much they are willing to pay. It seems irresponsible to move forward with any additional expenses on this project without knowing what the taxpayers agree they can support. Thank you. Thank you. Please. Uh, Zessa from Reading as well. Um, it came to my attention um, within the past week that um, something that the parents and community of Reading have been fighting tooth and nail for for about two years now is transparency and equity. And it's um, uh, very frustrating to find out that um, despite being told that we are uh, uh, being shown transparency and equity here in Reading, that we um, have now fallen by the wayside at Spanish classes in uh, the elementary school. So it sounds like there is a teacher at Woodstock who is available to the um, elementary school kids as they decide to take Spanish classes. Um, my understanding is that they are underutilized, so there is some spare time. Um, and that of the uh, four elementary schools in the district now, it seems like three of them at some uh, level within the pre-K pre through sixth grades have Spanish. Well, here at Reading we have absolutely none, and this is unacceptable to, unacceptable to me. And I'm wondering what the board is going to do to ensure that we are going to continue having, or maybe in the future, have some transparency and equity here at Reading. We are going to be discussing Spanish later in the, in the superintendent's <coughs> agenda, okay. so Thank it comes up. Yeah. Bob? Mine's on the Prosper Valley School. Yeah. Great. <coughs> you will you hear... Identify say, yourself. Oh, Bob yeah. Crane, Pomfret. Thank you. You will hear later this evening that the repairs to the HVAC system at uh, the Prosper Valley School will cost $97,000. 
This board should definitely direct the Finance Committee to budget this money and also direct the Buildings and Ground Director to immediately seek competitive bids for the project in order to reduce the expected cost. Eliminating the additional ducting to the two or three rooms on the west side of the building might also reduce the cost, but bids would, would uh, bear that out. Lost in the engineering reports is the fact that the school operated without a problem with the existing HVAC system for over 25 years. The failure of the foundation drains, laying off the janitor and closing up the school entirely during one of the wettest summers on record probably pushed things over the edge. The problem with budgeting only the HVAC system, though, without also budgeting a final cleaning of the building and some testing, is that a year from today, you still won't know whether you have a school you can use for anything, whatever you want to use it for. The only way to know is to budget a final cleaning of the school and several tests next fall, along with the repairs. A review of the most recently published budgets for the district shows that so far the FY20 building and maintenance budget for Prosper Valley was dropped $50,000 compared to fiscal 19. The Finance Committee is proposing to further reduce this for 21, a total of close to $100,000. To your credit, finding the money to fix the drains around the foundation is laudable. It was a great move, but it would have been a lot easier to do if these repair and maintenance budgets had not been cut in the first place. All that said, if this board cannot find your way to come up with this money to fix the HVAC system, I have another <coughs> proposal. The total of that would be about $135,000. Here's another option. Don't do it. Rather than repair the system, don't repair it, but budget the cleaning and testing alone. There's a chance that the repairs made so far will be all that's needed. It is, after all, um, it was found that there were holes in the foundation letting copious amounts of water into the foundation of the school in the wettest areas that were measured. So allow, that allowed water to get in, and now that it's sealed, that could solve the problem. But doing neither of the above should absolutely not be considered an option. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. <coughs> Anybody else like to, to speak? Okay. Okay. Um, thank you. Do we have any amendments? To, or we do have an amendment to the agenda to accept a grant. Is that correct? Yes. Um, the, after the board book went out on Friday, we got news that um, there's been a $5,000 donation from the Jack and Dorothy Byrne Foundation um, to support students who are unable to access food during their vacation. Um, the sum of money will be divided between the following vacations, 2000 for December, 1500 for February, and April for 1500 So there was a sense of urgency of accepting that grant so that those donations could be spent for December. Motion to accept. Second. Uh, that's, um, it's such a great grant. It's, have we received that before? Do you have any idea? We've received many uh, grants from the Burr Foundation, but not this one specifically. I'm aware of Gretchen. Gretchen, do you know if you've received money before? Yeah. Burr Foundation Burr 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 Burr
questions, concerns, comments, or anything that's not included in here that you want to ask me about? I think questions would be it's good. a question yeah. about, so not, you're talking about reducing from eight to six weeks the um, winter program. That's not for this upcoming year, that would no. be the following academic year. It's following year, and we would certainly have some public conversations about that, mm -hmm. parents and community. So are all, all the schools do eight weeks right now? The, the, way, the way it works is that there's eight weeks. One of the challenges that we sometimes run into is that um, there'll be a scheduled date for ski runners, then there'll be a weather event, and then that, that requires rescheduling a lot of the other activities. So there, there, it, there are some scheduling issues that come up, but you know, as John said, we want to sit down with ski runners and, and figure out something that makes sense for, for everybody moving forward. It, or traditionally, if it's a weather event and you can't have a ski day, is it rescheduled or is it canceled? Both. Um, some are rescheduled, some aren't. Sort of, it depends a little bit on the conditions at um, Suicide 6. Um, depends how many have been canceled. Um, yeah, so it's hard to say. I would be surprised if. You know, I haven't been here long enough to know when the switch from six to eight happened, but as I talk to people that have been in this for a long time, they're surprised when they hear it's eight. And I'm not sure there's even enough time left of the season to do makeup days now that they've scheduled it for eight. It's almost <coughs> like soon that there'll be two days, one or two days that get canceled. Um, but that causes other problems. Artistry, um, well actually artistry this year is running an eight-week program, whereas last year I think it was just six weeks, so there was some, some problem scheduling there. We are, again, anecdotally, I don't have hard data, but it's, it's um, thought that fewer kids are participating in the Suicide Six slash Artistry uh, part of the program. Um, I'd like to look into that. I'd like to find out if that's true, that, that data. Um, you know, it is somewhat costly for a family that's got multiple kids, that they need to rent equipment. Um, you know, we're talking, $200, $225 per student to, to ski those eight, eight days. So if you have two children, um, it's be kind of difficult. There are scholarships available, but... Does it cost anything for the artistry part of it? Yes. Know? Yeah, it's, it's uh, $85. Yeah, $85 for the artistry, um, plus $25 for the bus. Um, are the PTOs covering costs as well? No, um, I think the Ready PTO covers or may cover some of the costs this year. Um, I'm trying to think, Woodstock PTO does not cover. I think Barnard sometimes makes some contribution, and then Killington has a totally different program. We don't pay anything. They run their own program. The parents run it, and call. and that's yeah, it's run by the school and the parents. All kids either go to Killington School. Everybody sees or they or go home. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody's going to do anything else. Um, okay. Well, I. would love to do that. I'd love yeah. to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, think, uh, I definitely. I mean, I. I think that there's sort of enough variation that this merits a. This isn't for this year, but it merits a conversation in the the spring. I think a, a deeper dive, and I think at that point. You will have had time to reflect on and get get data from this winter and see what kids who was participating, what's the percentage rates. Um, the other thing that was important to me, certainly as a principal, is to make sure that parents and families really understand that this is not the Killington program is a school-run program. The ski runners and artists and artistry uh, art runners are not school-run programs, and so. From our point of view, kids are dismissed from school early to go to these programs. And I'm not sure that's clear to a lot of parents. And so in terms of issues of supervision, accountability for these kids um, while they're at the ski area, they're approximately, I've been told that there are about 300 students that are at um, Suicide Six on a given Friday participating in ski runners. And so, you know, the ski runners would like the schools to provide people to supervise the kids, and um, we're sort of leery of taking on that responsibility. Um, 
we don't have the staff. I mean, we, because we're splitting kids going there and staying here, for instance, Reading absolutely doesn't have a staff member that they can afford to send. You know, we have a local volunteer that, that has stepped up that will stay in the lodge and be sort of the person that they can talk to, and Woodstock is looking for somebody like that. But to go the next step and say that that one or two people from Woodstock, for instance, would be responsible for, um, I believe there are 87 or 88 students from Woodstock signed up, that's, that's not reasonable, right? I mean, you can't keep track of 87 kids. So who is keeping track of it? Those are kind of the questions I've been asking yeah. ski runners to try to make sure that they have a good system in place um, to account for the kids. Um, but on the other hand, I don't want the school district to be liable for it. I, I think this is an important further conversation that I'd like you to put on the agenda sure. for the spring, you know, to reflect on it um, and get information, especially if there are some proposed changes to what's going on. So. Yeah, it definitely is one of those things where we see different kinds of programs running in different places um, and some, some questions about how we work in partnership and, and also some questions about communication so that parents understand this is, what, this is where the school is involved and this is where the school isn't. And I think sitting down with ski runners and talking with them about how we work together to make something that's really valuable for kids. Thank you. Uh, what other questions do you have for John? Anything else? Okay, thank you, John. We appreciate it. Thanks for the thorough work. Stick around if you have more questions. Okay, thank you. Okay, we'll move on to the superintendent's report. Um, so in your packet, you have the superintendent's report. Um, I had indicated that we had a couple of errors in the December enrollment, so those have been corrected, and you have the updated version there. Um, one of the significant things that happened at the state level last week after our meeting was that the decision was made in terms of health insurance. Um, just as a reminder, the state had made a determination that we will have statewide health insurance plans for um, all communities. And there was an arbiter that was looking at a proposal from the Vermont School Boards Association and a proposal from the, the teachers union. Um, the, the arbiter decided to go with the proposal from the teachers union. And so the details that we will now be obligated to follow are in this particular document. This is something that obviously our negotiation team will have to unpack and take a look at, um, but I did want to let you know that that determination was made, and if you're interested in having further information, you can find it um, in the packet, and then there are links to even more information. And I, I'm sure everybody saw this um, this week from uh, their, their WCSU email, the Vermont School Boards Association, Association sent out, I believe it was yesterday, meetings that they're going to have around the state. I think there's one at Hartford High School. Um, I think they're in early January, I'm pretty sure, that will unpack for you, um, you know, what, what this is going to mean. I mean, it's something the Finance Committee is taking a, a close look at and negotiations, you know, it'll, it, it's going to impact our budget. So, um, but if any, and they're also, if you couldn't go to one of those meetings, they're going to have a webinar which you could um, access as well. So I think that was probably came to everybody in the email yesterday. Good. All right, um, next in your report, um, one of the things that the board had asked was to provide um, estimates for Spanish. did want to offer a couple points of clarification regarding that. Um, we have in last year instituted standard specials across the district, so all K through three students get one series of specials that includes two PE, one art, one media tech, and what am I leaving out? Something music. very music, thank you, and a music. Um, then in grades four through six, the students have those five specials along with three times 45 of Spanish. Um, there was a, a question that was raised last week regarding K3 Spanish. 
Um, one of the things that happens in all of our schools is that when we build schedules for support staff, sometimes there are holes in their schedule that, that are extra time that we can utilize. So at Woodstock Elementary School, we had some room in the Spanish teacher schedule. Um, and so in that school, we were able to provide during win block, which is an intervention block, um, students go to different places in the school. And we were able to have one session where students that um, needed some enrichment activities were able to go um, and get some Spanish during that time. I think there's about 12 students in total that take advantage of that. Um, that's a, that is a scheduling issue that became available and it seemed like it makes sense to, to do that if we were able to do that. Um, there, there are no other um, schools that have that particular flexibility in their schedule. So that is, so that is not something that we're able to do in any other school. I'm not sure if we'll be able to do it next year. It's a year by year schedule building piece. Uh, but that is one of the things that we, we do try to do is maximize um, schedules for our specialist staff um, so that we can serve kids in the best way possible. Um, and so that certainly was not any intent not to be transparent about it or to, um, to create situations where um, programs are offered to one group of students versus another. Uh, but there are realities in all of our schools in terms of our staff and where they may have some room to do something extra for students. And we try to make those decisions, you know, as, as need be. And to, again, maximize our staff time um, and wherever possible increase and augment experiences for kids. I wonder if I can ask a question about the cost estimates to provide Spanish in grades K through three. Where you say one 30 minute session per week is a 0.8, does that cover all the elementary school, like all the pre-K through the three kids? We, we think we can do that. Um, I'll remind folks that the, the feedback that we had received is that one 30 minute session is, is not valuable for kids. Um, and that we, we moved away from that because we didn't feel um, that when you experience a language at that level, it is not something that's, that's valuable. Um, but if we, it would be a pretty tight schedule, but we do think that that, that would be possible to do point eight. If you and that would be a cost of sixty thousand to thirty minute sessions would would that sixty include benefits or would that just be salary? Um, that would good question. I, I believe that would just no that it it depends at, the, at point eight that that has the potential to include benefits. I would remind the board again that the primary reason that we did this was not financial. We are not recommending putting Spanish um, back as a special in grades K through three. Um, we are very focused in terms of ensuring that we have um, focused attention on math and ELA, which we know are outcomes that we are not happy with in terms of our, our students' performance, um, and that we put in more intensive experiences in four, five, and six, where there were three separate doses of um, instruction which is the recommended for format for language instruction. Okay, I'm sorry, I didn't, I, I jumped and asked a question. I guess, let's ask though, is, are, there, are there further questions around, around this that people want to ask at this point? And, and understand that um, this has been included tonight, not for a vote, but just as a point of discussion, we're going to continue to, to sort of throw out sort of all these budgetary issues for us to have you know, just to have percolating, and we're going to talk a lot more about the budget later tonight, but um, this is, you know, we, we asked Mary Beth to give us some numbers around this. What does this look like? Um, so this is, we're not voting on this or anything tonight, but if there are further questions or um, something that you'd like Mary Beth to tease out or, um, or clarify for next meeting, you know, to give us more information on this, is there anything else people want to talk about? Yes, Alan. Um, I'll, I'll go back. It, you know, it's an equity issue. When you spoke to, I spoke to it last week. I, I hear what you're saying. It's an enrichment opportunity. Um, 
the same time you're saying you felt that you know the senior leadership team or whoever it was said it wasn't valuable. It wasn't a value to have it for Kate. Um, moving forward, I, I would respectfully request that this is something that's equitably provided for enrichment across the district because the face value of it is just inequitable. Um, in the context of what's happened over the last two to three years in terms of becoming a unified district and really trying to have equitable things across the district, this, this doesn't fit in that category. So I would respectfully ask that uh, the senior leadership team, ask for participation from the board of how can this repaired, be repaired in some way so that it feels equitable across the district. I could, there's just one thing I want to sort of, I want to discuss and, or, or sort of push back on. And this is a little different because this is, to me, a um, this is a, um, an edu like Spanish is a class that you take. But I do think, like across all of our elementary schools, there are experiences that we offer our children that are not all. I mean, they're different. It doesn't mean they're not equal. But like you know, the, the question of you know, is fairness always have to be exactly the same? You know, you know I just wonder, like as we go forward, because I think there are important opportunities that each elementary school building and community offers their kids and we can't necessarily replicate those everywhere you know so just yes. to just yes. wholeheartedly agree that yeah. you yourself just said it's it's, a, it's an educational, educational class, right? totally yes that, yeah. outdoor classrooms or some unique you know that this is a class yeah. that yeah. you know k through three reading students are going to be in the same level of spanish eventually with woodstock students right so we want this to be equitable. They're getting some foundation laid that kids in Reading are not. No, and, totally, and I agree because it's an educate. It's a class. In my well, yeah, yes and no. So it's part of an intervention block, right? So there are services, and the way that intervention works in all of our elementary schools differs because of the the structure of those schools. Um, so um, at West and at Killington, there is something called a wind block. So this is. This is built into a wind block, right? And that is, so it's, it's an intervention structure that does not work at every school. There are 12 students in the combined K through 12, uh, K through two level that have this as an offering during that what I need block time. Um, and so, you know, the vast majority of students at West actually don't get this particular service. The, you know, that's, so I, I see it as an intervention blocks structure that we cannot do the same thing in every school given the scheduling that exists there. And so when we, so it, using that structure, um, trying to look at um, experiences that kids could have that would stretch them in that area when their entire section of that school is is dealing with intervention um, that to me feels different than an academic class okay. um, thank you for the additional information Mary Beth because at that point is um, somewhat dramatic to me because the, the, there's 101 kids in that group, and to say only 12, it, that, that's that's a little more clarifying as to what that is happening there. Um, and just just to, to be clear as well, so this would be a, if we did put this in, this would be a direct swap out of time from either ELA or math. There, um, it, would, it would have to come out. Yeah, way to put it in would be to take time away from those two particular areas. Is that or you or some you know math, science, social studies, writing, ELA, right? Okay. Those are the content areas, um, which is why that at this point we are not recommending that we pull kids out of okay. those core. So that might be variably decided at each different school. If that if they, say we did put Spanish back in, would each school decide? No, what, that, where it falls in their schedule. So yes. if you went to any elementary school in our district, when somebody gets PE or art, varies. So we, we look at everybody's schedule and map it all up, and this teacher's going to be here on Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday. So it, that's already happening, the time at which it's delivered. Um, so what this would be is now we'd have to figure out where, where you pull kids from class 
for, for 30 minutes ac across every school. Again, the time and day would vary from school to school. Um, and one final thing, if this were, say, to continue the way it is currently, mm -hmm. where it is this option for some mm -hmm. students at West, but not available elsewhere, um, could that be a school choice decision for a parent? You know, could we know enough in advance for next year to say, I really want my second grader to have Spanish, I'm going to say someone's wanted to choice their child to less. Yeah, is, I, that, I, yeah. is that even... When we build the sketch, I can't guarantee that this would even be an option. Okay, I'm just, you know, I'm just it, to answer when, people's concerns. Yeah, no, it's it's yeah, it's a good question. Um, I don't until we actually build out every schedule, and that's something that takes many days and many meetings over the course of the summer or, or over the course of the spring, and then the the principals go and they build out the whole schedule for the school. Then we see where we have extra room. You know, so. You know, this this work this year, it may or may not work next year, depending. So that helps clarify. I'm just curious, are the wind blocks once or twice a week? Um, I believe that they are three times a week. John, if I get that right? Uh, well, let's see. At West, they are three times a week in third, fourth, and fifth grade. They are three to four times a week. Never, never a simple answer, right? <laughs> Claire, I'm just wondering if there would be the points that would be useful to use to evaluate whether removing Spanish from the curriculum this year has impacted our um, scores in math and ELA. Like, is there any data that we could use to determine whether or not that's been whether or not that's accomplished the goal of uh, improved, or is it too soon? I think at, at this point it would be too early. That's, you know, that's something we could potentially look at at the end of the school year. Mm -hmm. um, I think the other point of data that will be valuable around this is our sixth graders who have experienced Spanish three times a week. What's their level of preparation when they're entering the middle school, high school? Have we, in fact, increase that because that was part of the design as well. Mm -hmm. So that those may be a couple points of data. Mm -hmm. Sam? Um, I don't really have any questions, just some feedback. As a sixth grader, as a parent of a sixth grader who is now getting it three times a week, while before he was getting it once a week for 30 minutes, um, when he was getting it once a week for 30 minutes, he really had nothing to say about Spanish. He didn't seem to ever, I talked to him about it. He didn't really have any, now he, he will talk in Spanish. He will just say sentences around the house. He talks about it frequently. Um, it's definitely, he's getting an impression on it. Well, so I, as, just as a feedback, of, as a parent who is now a sixth grader is getting it through times a week, I honestly would say that maybe if he hadn't gotten in kindergarten and just spent more time in math and ELA, that would have been okay because when he was getting it, I, he never talked about it. He had nothing he could really say about it. I mean, I'm not saying he didn't do anything. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm, I am I'm saying that it's definitely making a better impact on him now than it was before. Who knows, though, he might be getting, doing better because he did get it that once a week before. <laughs> <laughs> um, does anybody have any? further comments on this or anything else they'd like Mary Beth to look into for us. This will be a continuing conversation. Um, but any, anything else further with regards to this? Um, oh, you know, and I, I, I flew by some very important news <laughs> at the bottom of the <laughs> enrollment um, that the, um, the town of Barnard have had its merger vote. Um, and they had voted 119 to 85 to voluntarily join our district. Um, we are, I think, speak, speaking collectively for our colleagues, excited about the fact that Barnard is interested in, in joining our merged district. Um, and we look forward to um, a vote of the, the, the merged towns in March to hopefully accept them in and um, continue the um, partnership that we'd have, we've had with them all along um, and to um, work collaboratively to make the transition as smooth as possible. Yes. Yes. Um, follow
follow up from last week on the enrollment. Do you know when um, one of the one of the requests last week was to find out when we can see how many children are tuition and not tuition? Do we know when we're going to have that? So. That, that's going to be a new report, and we're looking to have that an a, a additional report each month starting in January. Thank you. Can I ask you a question? No. Just to clarify? Is, oh. uh, this number is that... Um, no, I'm, you have a clarifying question on something that's, I mean... Exactly. What, what is it? Yes. Yeah. The number of students, are, does that equal as pupils? No. No, no, no. It isn't. Just number of students. Yeah, and we just so the board knows the the information from the state is that we should have equalized pupil hopefully next week. Um, but we are still waiting for that information. We don't have that yet. Um, some I think some really good news. Um, <coughs> one of the things that this we had decided to do when there were safety and security monies that came out of the state level and everybody was applying for them and they had 30 minute quick visits to schools to look at what they might need. We took a different approach and we had a comprehensive evaluation come in and we um, had uh, Rob Evans and his team from the state look at um, each of our schools. They spent about three, three days in district, Sherry. Um, looking at all of our facilities in depth, meeting with our administrative team, and um, the compliments to Sherry Souza and Joe Rigoli, who took all that information and put that together in a statewide grant request that went in this fall. Um, and we're really pleased to share that last week we were informed that we received $129,900 in grant funds for. Um, all of our schools in the district. Um, uh, there is a very short window to, to spend these funds. They, they have to be spent by June. So Joe is already digging in and uh, working to um, get these pieces done. Um, but I, I really want to, again, recognize the work of Sherry and Joe and to let all of our communities know that as a result of these grant funds, our facilities will have upgrades um, the, the upgrades vary depending on the needs of each individual school. That's great. Thank you very much for doing that. Jim. Can we hear from Joe, like, what are we looking at? Yep. Yeah. Joe, do you want to give us a little bit of comment, or, or Sherry, too, since you Idea is not every single one, but... Sure. Uh, mostly it's, uh, we're going to do some cameras on the outside of buildings, better lighting, uh, doorway buzzers, that type of stuff, where folks will be able to access people with a buzzer rather than opening up the door. Uh, mostly things like that. We're going to do a little security with some windows as well. Uh, but in a nutshell, it's, it's mostly, uh, it's going to be some doors. We're going to spend a lot of money in doors. And some locks. We'll be changing out locks on the classrooms so that they're one motion rather than the old style that we have now with the key fumbling to lock it. So, right, does the state set out what you have to do with this money? Correct. They, they stipulate what amount we have and where to spend it. And we really can't deviate from that. So, to follow up question. You know, one of the big things was the um, fire safety or whatever, and especially in middle school, high school, yep. with the doors. Do we have anything going on? We, we do. We, we, they gave us a little bit of money for some exterior doors, but we didn't get any money for as far as like doors remaining open. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that wasn't included. This is safety and security. So, um, the, it would have been too much money. Our, our system there is overtaxed, okay. the electrical system in the high school. Okay. Yeah, we were only in that. So we really try to maximize, and we were really this very step down the process in terms of what items could we purchase. It was very tight in terms of its writing, and each school had a separate grant to submit. So it was not just a shopping list; it really had to be tight and specific. And they gave us ten days to turn around the grant. So it was a well. Thank you both very weeks. much. That's great news for the district. Yeah, Claire. I just wanted to echo that. Thank you so much for doing all that hard work. That's amazing and really important. Just celebrate that a little yeah. bit. So, thank you. Okay. Um, just a couple other points of information. Um, we talked about the Cross Valley HVAC system. So, what we have in here is the estimated operating costs for the HVAC system. You'll see it comes in around 5,500. 
Joe's recommendation to budget for around 8,000 because the 5,500 only rec um, reflects operating the system six months a year. Um, and then you also have the um, bid from or the um, organization that would be doing the work in terms of installation of the HVAC. So you'll have, you have that um, in terms of detail. And that is Superintendent's report. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay. So next we go uh, through the committees. Um, I will nothing really from Chair Finance uh, or Chair Vice Chair. Uh, Paige is doing well. She couldn't be here tonight, so we'll just you know, keep going. She's getting better. Um, finance. Uh, we met on Friday, and um, we're going to start to present things to you tonight. You know. It's just going to be real tight, real, real tight. So um, a lot of contractual obligations that we can't do anything about. So um, and this latest uh, decision from the state too is going to further impact it. So um, you know, we're going to have to be making some important decisions. Uh, we're going to talk later tonight about um, the uh, possibility of pushing out, you know, we'll have a discussion about pushing out the annual budget vote um, to the level of um, uh, discomfort uh, by the finance committee about where we're going to be on these numbers and really um, and really having solid numbers to be able to present to the voters uh, in time. Remember, it's not just to, that we have it ready for March. It needs to be ready the second to third week in January to be printed. And, um, you know, we're just not confident we're going to have that ready. Um, not not because we can't have, not because Mike can't have the numbers, but because um, we, we're not getting numbers from the state. And that's how it always is. But we're gonna we want to have a discussion about that later tonight. Um, additionally, um, I'm very appreciative uh, the finance committee is of, of Mike's work. Um, we are really trying to get he is really trying to get 2019 closed. We're going to talk more about that. That is crucial. Uh, it's another part of, of pushing out the annual budget vote. How can we vote on something when 19 is not been closed? Um, and um, so uh, I, there's a lot of good work being done. Uh, Mike's working really long hours, and, and we are very appreciative of his work. Um, so it continues on. We'll continue to have, uh, over the next couple months, really regular finance committee meetings. Um, and uh, welcome everybody who can come. Uh, the more voices and ears, the better. I don't know. I have to work this week. <laughs> I can do it this week. We'll do something. I, we haven't announced it yet. I have to look at my schedule. Um, so anyway, that's where it stands, and it's not. It just there's a lot of there's a lot of moving pieces, and um, and so understand that what we asked Mary Beth to put in her superintendent's report is just so you can have information, so we can continue to be able to okay. There's all these pieces. We're gonna have to make all these kinds of choices. Um, we're not voting tonight on anything. We're just continuing to give information so that when we get to the place that we can vote, we will, it's not the first time we've seen things. So we'll continue. That's why we'll talk about food service tonight, building and maintenance, and technology. Um, so that's finance. Uh, policy. Can I? Oh, I'm sorry. So I just got a text from my good friend Mike in the back who wanted me to remind everybody yeah. that it is not just his efforts, but the efforts of his entire team that are working late, um, mid burning the midnight oil, but I would concur. Um, while the, the team has a fabulous leader, um, it is absolutely a team effort, and um, we appreciate all the employees that are given 100%. Okay, policy. Okay, so we're working on a lot of policy items that are going to be coming up in the next meeting. We don't have any for adoption okay. or any, we have nothing tonight to yeah. give to you, but the, uh, But it's been a week, I don't understand. You've had a whole week, <laughs> <laughs> But we did meet this morning, but it's been a um, These are the policies that we are working on in January and February, um, in no particular order. Uh, choice, allergy and or anaphylaxis, gender identity and expression, naming rights, mm. medication, parent concern, educational records, part of security, safety, security, Yes. Uh, per pupil cost calculation of campus sustainability policy and the famous sinking of policy and procedures that we've been talking about for over a year and haven't gotten to yet. Okay. 
Your list is short. Thank you. <laughs> uh, can we just Yeah, so I'm going to let Sam update us on her um, listserv and um, Facebook and other efforts with getting uh, out there. To the yeah, I actually am disappointed that the woman from the community isn't here who specifically asked for this because I was excited to inform her. Um, but hopefully she'll find out through these efforts. Um, I have joined Listserv as a, the Community Engagement Committee. Um, Barnard, Bridgewater, Pomfret, Sharon, just because, why not? Um, Upper Valley, and like Upper Valley just says everywhere, kind of I guess broadly, and then Woodstock. Those are the people who have Listservs. I've joined Front Porch Forum as a government entity, and it's now uh, Woodstock, Bridgewater, Pond, Barnard, Pomfret, Killington, Menden, Westminster, Reading, and Plymouth. Um, I have, uh, you know, and this is all just last week, but I have already done two postings on both of those, um, and I'm planning on doing a couple more tomorrow, reminding people of the um, facility tour that's this upcoming Thursday, and um, also a few of the press releases. I'll be, every time we do a press release, I will be sending it out. Um, now that I've found all of them, um, that was the biggest time consuming, because everybody has one someplace, but they don't have their other places. Um, I'm now on the um, Windsor Central Supervisory Union Facebook page. That was also time consuming because some people have groups some, and some have pages and finding them all. I think I've found them all. If you know of one in your community that I might, you don't notice me posting on, um, please reach out, let me know because I'd be happy to add them to my list. Um, so far I've found ones in Prosper Valley has a group that's very active. Killington Elementary School student, uh, parents has a group. Woodstock Union High School alumni. Um, <coughs> Woodstock Elementary School has a PTO page, not group. It's a whole other thing of posting, but <coughs> figuring it out. Um, Plymouth has a um, group. So yeah. And then we, when I took over it last week, there were 66 followers. I've now gotten it to 111 um, people who are following it. And um, we've got, we, uh, their organic, um, what's the way they term it? The organic reach of people has, I've, from like two to 29 people for the things that I'm posting. and. I think the last post I got over 600 reach while well, past ones have been in like the 50s. So I'm excited. This is fun. I enjoyed doing this. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for doing that. Yes, yeah, so Sam's doing a great job. Um, a fun little shout out to Jen Plaster, the co chair of the Community Engagement Committee, who played the violin and the performance of um, A Christmas Carol this weekend. So that was true community engagement at its best. <laughs> so for those of you who had a chance to listen, that was really, she did a nice job. Um, and then another project that we talked about starting this um, at our past meeting last week was to create, um, with student and faculty help, some sort of little brochure highlighting the different programs that our, our middle and high school offer. Um, for example, STEM, our band and music, our theater program, our foreign, foreign language program that can be used to um, recruit students from the talents about choice. So we're, okay, that's one of the things we're looking for. Okay, that's an update I have. Okay. Yeah, I mean, just to follow up on that, we were always uh, counting really, we are, uh, the secretary at our school, Sheila Pilsnicker, was great. She's just an incredible writer, and she always, we did a packet that went out to every new homeowner in Killington, yeah. Pittsfield, and you know it was a whole packet with the brochures and all the offerings. Like it's huge for school choice families. And yeah, so the important that, piece that we need to have. Person for us to kind of She's incredible. She really is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, Thank you. Jill. Yep. Um, ben, is that Bob there? Too? Yeah. Ben and Bob. Bob. Yeah, I was going to uh, going to have. Bob, my co-chair, co uh, Bob Coates, give the uh, uh, new build committee report, but he's dialed in, so probably not a, uh, <laughs> in a position to do that. But uh, not, not much to report. 
Oh, go ahead, Rob. You had a retort? No, I said thank you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, so not, not a lot to report. Um, we had a call with uh, the architect Lee Sherwood, uh, Mary Beth, Bob, and I uh, last week. Uh, did some scheduling. Talked about two things. One was uh, contracting, um, the approach towards um, this next phase of detailed design work um, will be uh, done on a, a, a letter of authorization per the board uh, motion. Then uh, once that gets into place, there'll be a, um, a more comprehensive contract with detailed scope. Um, for the discussion we had last week, that gets uh, more flushed out with the, the full, um, all, uh, you know, all, if all if all goes well with uh, more more full funding. Um, then, uh, as far as scheduling goes, uh, we've set uh, January seventh uh, and tenth uh, two two meetings after the break. Um, one to meet with um, Lee uh, from a, a leadership team. I'd like to um, schedule. I'm thinking, I know it's tight, but just with the holidays, uh, we're looking at um, the day before uh, for a um, new bill, full new bill committee uh, meeting. That's a, an off week for a board meeting. Um, so we'll look to get that warned. Uh, one of the things we'd like to do is um, get uh, some more involvement from that larger committee onto the subcommittee that um, Lee and his team are a part of. So that'll be one of the things that we'll, we'll take with them. Uh, and then there'll be a, another meeting on uh, the 10th, um, and we've identified some uh, staff and faculty members. The focus of that meeting will be on uh, refinements to the programming aspects of the, of the new building. Right now. So that's, uh, that's the update. Bob, did you have anything uh, else from our, our discussions last week? No, I think I have Okay. Pamela? Did you just say there's a subcommittee that the architect is on? Did he be a part of, correct? That's part of the. Um, the, the new build um, committee is the, the larger committee with like I think nine or eleven board members. And then you may and you were at the uh, that uh, the first new build committee uh, meeting where we talked about the various subcommittees, communications, public, and then there's the um, the aspect of the, of the yeah the architect himself is is part of a, a subcommittee. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Um, Tim, buildings or Matt, buildings and grounds? Two buildings and grounds? Oh, you're not good. <laughs> <laughs> buildings and grounds. I don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> you just never used to be. Yeah, that's too much. I'm sorry. Well, Matt. Uh, this is usually Bryce's deal. It's not mine. <laughs> okay. Yeah. No. I'm just saying Matt. Okay. Uh, we haven't met again, so we haven't done anything. Okay. Joe's been doing a great job. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to hear from Joe later. Okay. Um, Adam. Have you guys met? We have okay. a rescheduled meeting for this Thursday. For this Thursday, okay. Uh, and Lou is not here. Do you guys have a meeting set for hiring? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. We'll get there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and negotiations. You have anything? Um, no, we just have to go through that new information um, with Mike when he gets a breather yeah. and figure out how it's going to impact and then come back with those numbers. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so we're done with uh, reporting <coughs> to the board. Now we're going to do time scheduled appointments. So first, uh, okay, now that we're going to start to look at um, this F21, FY21 budget, um, a couple of three buckets that we looked at at the last finance committee meeting, uh, food service, buildings, and maintenance, and technology. So you'll see in your board packet and and um, and Mike maybe do you want to come up here Mike and come sit with us for a minute <laughs> <laughs> you can sit right in the middle here Mike <laughs> Okay, so um, this this memo, this overview that you prepared for us, <coughs> service. So, uh, do you want to? Um, and I see we have Gretchen here too. So thank you for being here. She was at our finance committee meeting as well. Thank you. Just sort of highlighting. Can you give it? The full board some highlights on the food service, sort of, you know, where we are and what what adjustments are being made to, to kind of keep it close to what it was this year. Sure. And I, I think as everyone knows, you know, the quality of the food service program here in this district is is, is very high. 
uh, but that quality of service that we provide comes at a cost. I'd love to sit here and tell you it's, it's cost neutral, that we, we get enough federal and state subsidies uh, and, and we raise enough in, in the lunch money concession and breakfast funds that come in to, to completely pay for those costs. Um, but what we do try to do is manage those costs the best that we can. And that's what Gretchen does and her collective team. And they deserve a lot of this credit. Um, in comparison to last year, all I can say is I wasn't here for the budget. What I'm noticing so far is that there might have been some overestimations on the revenue side. Um, and so that's just causing a little bit of variability as we look at this year and how we think this year is going to finish. What Gretchen and I and the collective team and Mary Beth are trying to do is to rectify that. Is to say, where, what are the revenues that we're going to earn when we talk about the free and reduced subsidies from the state and the feds? Um, when we talk about what our real um, revenue is that comes in from the lunch money that we can collect and deposit into our account. And so we're trying to get that more accurate and tighter. And, and so, so it's, to, it's to minimize the impact of what that cost is to our district. Some of the creative ideas I think we've come up with, with the help of Gretchen, of course, is that, you know, it's been, it's been a couple of years now. So this is year two. And so we're building a bunch of fiscal year 21, which would be year three of the program. We bring up this, this thought that we haven't raised prices, whether it's brec uh, breakfast for the children or for the adults, or for lunches for the children and the adults. And this might be the time to visit, revisit what we charge. And we're not talking about quantum leaps here in pricing. Um, not to jump around, but I think in the board package, there is a suggested pricing for fiscal year 21. Okay, this is where we would potentially, at the elementary level, you know, raise a little bit um, of breakfast and adult pricing, as well as the lunch for students and the adults. This is to help minimize that impact that I talked about earlier of, of the cost to operate such a great program. This could potentially bring in um, 17,000 at fiscal year 19 participation rates, and that's important because my dear Gretchen, Gretchen just showed me tonight the increased participation we're already seeing in December of this year compared to where we were in December of last year. So that's good news. The quality of the product, what we're serving and what we're doing for the community is providing a better participation, which is gonna to lead to probably a, a better number that we're showing here. But we try to be conservative, because I, I, I'd rather be conservative than overly aggressive. Um, and I, I would have it on the, the form that I saw at the finance committee, but yep. this 288, which yep. is the total projected budget, where was it last year? Correct. So the budget came in right around that, okay? But, but that's a budget, and we know budgets are only solid if they're built accurately uh, with good information. And so because of the revenues that I'm seeing are a little bit behind schedule, or maybe a little too aggressively um, estimated, Project, estimated yeah. projected, that we might be running a little bit harder than that. But we're going to manage it very tightly um, and, and do the best we can to come in and where we, we thought we would. But this budget, I feel much better about. Um, we'll hit that number. But this is, this 288 is a pretty, I mean, there isn't really an increase over FY20? The, 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 yeah. the budget, it's the budget, correct. Okay. So we'll see how the actuals for this yeah, yeah, come so in. Yeah, just, just so everybody here can clarify, this budget, 288 number, is in the revenue or is it the... Good question, Jim. It's the net. That's a net. very good question. It is the net of what revenues and expenses are. And it's, that means we're absorbing 290000 in expenses higher than what we're able to pull in for revenue. Okay, so, so then what is the expense and what is the revenue? Sure. So I... I I don't have it in front of me. If I had, if I had a guesstimate right now, I believe the revenues are around, uh, let's call it 400000 in totality, and I think the expenses are around 690, which is where your 290 is coming from. Our expenses to run the program is 690. Correct. And we're taking in $400,000. High numbers, yes, that sounds good. Okay. Thank yep. you. And Sounds right. Just one other piece around that. So this is what it cost to run the program. So when you saw things like the common bed numbers that we had, that's that's <coughs> embedded in here. So this isn't going to be a, a 288,000 addition to those numbers you already saw because some of that that cost is going to be absorbed absorbed in common bed numbers. 
Yes, ma'am. Yeah, well, um, so just a little um, institutional memory for the people that are that are new to newer to the board and to the um, institution. Uh, about two years ago, the the um, combined food some food was an SU at that time. And the combined budget was close to eight hundred thousand just for, um, and we had the goal of reducing it by three hundred thousand, um, which we ended up voting on reducing it, going for $200,000 as a goal to reduce it. And we were able to reduce it, if I recall correctly, to about 160. It was 150. Yeah, okay. So we were able to, to do that. And, um, you mean from a, a budgetary standpoint or from an actual? Well, so that, here I have the paperwork, so that our proposed, um, our proposed budget was 656. So that was down from 800. So that was that was success. So this is from an expense standpoint, uh, or from the standpoint of our goal of reducing the deficit. Um, the the cost that what's being called here a budget item was being called a deficit, and I think that's an interest. That's how the language that Richard used, and I think that's. Um, you know, we all understood it as this, we're trying to get rid of this deficit so that we could be cost neutral because Richard brought to us research comparing us to other schools that showed that many, I think most schools are cost neutral with their, with their food programs. So, um, so I think it's important that we don't forget that the goal is to keep this going down and not think that it's a budget. You think, you, you think you should, maybe the next board meeting you could share these schools that are cost neutral? Richard, I don't know, Richard had, had, had spoken to all of us about being at a business man a finance director's meeting and, you know, always asking people, you know, what's, what's your deficit that you're running in food service? And I mean, ours was extraordinarily high. I mean, markedly. <coughs> and that was, you know, what really spurred us to look at, you know, there has to be a way that we can, we can provide good service, but not run. Interesting. I wonder. I, I wonder maybe what variables are impacting these other communities if they're able to to get cost neutrality. Like for example, what is their free and reduced percentage compared to what we have? I mean, are they in the 35 to 40 percent range where we're in the 25 percent range? I mean, I wonder if these other variables are what's impacting this. This uh, many other towns across the, the community are cost neutral. That'd be interesting to see. Maybe you could help us, you know, collect some of that, and, and I'll work with Gretchen to see what we can collect, and then come together and figure out are, are we really that far off, or is it, are there other variables that are driving? Well, I, I just think Pamela's comment is a good reminder. I mean, we you know, the, we have gone down, but the intent was certainly not to like have it go up. So I mean, this is appropriate if this is if this is a zero percent, you know, or pretty flat budget, you know. We, we don't want to see an increase. I mean, the, the goal in this always was our, our, our loss is so much higher than other districts. We want to really keep keep a check on it. I'm sorry, was there a hand here? Yeah, no, I was just going to comment. Uh, in Sherry's letter, she I think she referenced another school district that had a 65% of free reduced lunch participation. It's got wow. higher uh, That's like almost three meetings. times as high as ours. Yeah. So there's probably some great variability around this. Yeah, and it, I could just comment that if you remember, we put this out to bid. Um, to two food service organizations and then um, an in-house program. And the, the kind of idea that the, the food service programs would come in with a net amount <coughs> did not play itself out in those numbers. Um, they were slightly lower, but not, not the, the net neutral number that we had anticipated. Um, so this is something that you know I think we can continue to work on. For the, for we now have one complete year of data with this new program. Um, and so I, I think that the number is coming down, not as fast as we would like, uh, but that's something that we can continue to work on. And as we get more data, um, I anticipate that we'll, we'll be able to have better projections for you in terms of moving forward. Last question, do you think the AOE has a record of this type of line item of school budgets? Wonder. I'm sure yeah. we could ask. We could yeah. ask Rose. I know if you, the next business manager meeting, if you could just check in with some folks. And we do kind of a more informal poll. Yeah. Well, they, they have a, um, each district has to submit a final year end children nutrition report that shows all the revenues and expenses. I'm sure we could ask Rosie at the AOE 
to allow us visibility to those numbers and see. But even then, I'd like to understand what the dynamics, what they're free and reduced, right? So we're looking at an apple and an apple, the same similar size, just the same number of kids, what their percentage of free and reduced is and see, are we really that awful or are there dynamics that are driving that? I think also the quality of the food, I and mean, we're serving really the quality of food, right. and I think that that's crucial to health and right. success. And you know, and also reduction of all cause mortality. If you look at reduction of cancer risk, high blood pressure, diabetes, um, you name it. Over time, it really has to do with the quality of food you're putting into your body. So I think it is money well spent. And I just want to commend Gretchen on the really amazing work that she's doing Great. across the district. I think she's like just such an amazing asset to our district. So I, I just really appreciate all of your hard work and, and feeding our students um, and, and faculty such healthy foods. Especially knowing in yes. some cases that's the best meal they're going to get that right. day. Exactly. Sam, I was, I mean, I put my hand up, but Claire really said a lot of what I was going to say. I mean, the, the prices that we're asking for the quality of the food that's being put out is extremely reasonable. Um, I wanted to raise it more, but she wouldn't let me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I agree um, with you. For the product, you exactly. know, speaking from someone who works in the food industry, knowing how much those the quality of the ingredients she's using costs, I mean, it's it's pretty commendable. Um, and I don't think anything that they're going to get at home that apparently a PB and J that they make at home is going to cost apparently much less than that. Um, and I also have to comment on the fact that they have a. Um, if anyone doesn't, they have a fantastic Instagram page that they start, post a lot of really great pictures of the food and they have a lot of followers and I think that that's great too to really kind of get the public um, up and knowledgeable about what products they're putting out for our children to eat. I think it's great. Uh, just very quickly add that, you know, it's easy to forget where you've been in the past year, but, you know, prior to last year we had different food service programs in every school. They weren't integrated, um, and the, in one year they have been fully integrated. Um, this program now runs as a whole system, and we've been able to, not we, the Royal We, <laughs> Gretchen and her team have been able to um, increase the quality of the offerings for students in a remarkable way in a, a single year's time. So I continue to be very um, encouraged about what this program is going to do in the future and echo everybody else's comments about the quality of the staff and the effort that they're putting forth to make this work. And I'd just like to ask, remind you, sir, sir, if you could just uh, fill the board in, Gretchen. So um, next year with Barnard going forward, assuming that um, the whole district accepts them in March, what is the status of Barnard's food program? Is that easily just, I mean, can you just comment on that? It's a four-hour person that will still come out with food because of the University of Houston at Barnard, but it's been a huge success. Um, their participation rate is about 50 percent. Um, so you, like right now, they buy, I mean, they buy the food from no, the we Houston. buy the food, we prepare oh, the yeah, food, okay. they yeah. come pick it up. Um, so their, their cost right now is a, a four-hour staff person in my village. Okay. And we, we, we pay for the food and, you know, dishwashing so that yeah, and you keep the the proceeds, proceeds the the charge for the food. Okay, but that will be. I mean, with with them integrated, there's no change. I mean, it sort of just keeps going as is. But. I hope so. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Great. <laughs> yeah. Great. Okay. Um, are there other questions in regard to food service as part of the budget? Okay. So. Let's move on to buildings and grounds. Ooh. Joe, did you want to come up too? One more seat, Joe. Okay. So, Mike, give us a this is a little bigger number, so. Yes. So, um, in this particular budget, this is an all-in uh, buildings and grounds. So, this this includes. This includes Joe's uh, dynamic team across all the different uh, locations that we operate at. Um, it includes you know, all items, the salary, the benefits, of course, and then all the, the maintenance and repairs and supplies and, and snow removal and all the items that are necessary to, to successfully keep these buildings safe and operating. Um, that number is... Does it include utilities? It does. Okay. Yep. 
Uh, and I believe it, it includes the internet too. Well. It does. Phone, the internet. Phone, and internet. That's under UNA technology. Correct. Okay. And food service as well. All the uh, the appliances, the fridge, the stove, all of that. Those are all under buildings. Yeah, correct. Okay. The maintenance that, that could be needed for those okay. appliances. Yep. And so this budget increase that we're seeing uh, of that 265 obviously includes uh, the contractual obligations that we have that I think you alluded to earlier, Jennifer, um, as well as the, the mandatory state health care increase of 12.9%. So it's, you know, it's a mixture of that. Plus, there were some you know, different line items, gives and takes, that we want to make sure are in that might have been missed in fiscal year 20. We're just trying to give a, a full uh, transparency of what those items are. And so that's, this is what I'm seeing from a year over year of about 265. And uh, there's an important note I think everyone should, should take away with is that unfortunately this budget uh, only allows currently about 50,000 of capital expenditures uh, across the entire district. And, and I think that's a, a pretty low number for such a large number of buildings that are old and need work. So that's, uh, that's not the best news I could provide, but that's what it is. Joe, could you uh, comment on what would be, I mean, last year, as a reminder for everybody, I think we put about, I'm pretty sure we put 150 um, into capital expenses. Does that sound right? 150? 150 was, and, was, was that the number? Um, and uh, what would be, are you spending, I mean, you're going to spend all, is 150 hasn't been already spent? Or? Yeah, 150 is gone. 150 is gone. Okay. 150 is gone. So, um, so what, what, what we need to be is uh, neutral this year, is just literally maintain what we have and keep our fingers crossed that we don't have any uh, breaks. Anything breaks, yeah, and uh, we don't need any large capital improvement projects. Uh, industry standard is around 3%. Uh, is what 3 percent of what? Of replacement value on the buildings. Um, we have about 230,000 square feet worth of buildings. Um, 230. Uh, rule of thumb to rebuild those is probably around 300 a square foot. That's probably low. So, um, real quick, that number is probably like 68 million worth of buildings. So, 3% of that we're looking at 1.2 to 2 million a year. In theory, is what we should be setting aside for replacement, not providing uh, O and M, which is reflected in this budget. Yeah. So, so, so although we might not have it in a, from a budgetary perspective because things are tight, here's the good news. If there was a crisis and we had to replace boilers or an HVAC system, at certain locations we do have reserves. As a combined mud district now, we have reserves that we can tap in the event of an emergency like that. That's what they're there for. So if, um, if needed. Okay, we could what are those? It is my, it is my recollection though that those building reserves stay with the buildings. Correct. Correct. I think you. I think they almost have to. The way, no, I, the way Paige was explaining. I, I, it I know me. they have to. Okay. <laughs> so, so it's it's certain locations, Kellington, Reading, West. There are there are small reserves that we could tap. It's the high school that has the lion's share of the reserves, uh, and they, that's the biggest building. So that's kind of appropriate from a a, a fund expenditure standpoint, where the risk is. Okay. So if, at this point, though, the only building that does not have any reserve left is Prosper Valley? Yes. Other, yeah, and we can't tap what's left on that reserve yeah. because I think it's related to the observatory or okay. things that we can't touch. Okay. It's a very specific reserve. Okay, so just really wanting everybody to understand, you know, the $50,000 is not much at all to put into building maintenance <coughs> for all of our buildings. Or not building maintenance, capital, capital improvements. 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 I was just trying to make sense of the number you were throwing out earlier about a percentage of total square footage. That's for replacement as a, a to build up a reserve when it's time to rebuild. Correct. Yeah. Is that very kind of um, I guess best practice um, relation to what you would budget for repairs? I guess you're trying to reconcile those two. Yeah, um, repairs. I, I couldn't give you an, an offhand like. A, a percentage of what we should be putting away. Um, it, it's generally replacement value because you know, in theory, a building will last 25 years and it's either uh, replace or repair usually. Mm -hmm. So they take the total value of that divided by either, I think he was using 39. 39, 39, is, 39 is the number, yeah. give or take, yeah. Jim. The commercial building is 39 years of depreciated. The big reason why we have to get our um, audit done 
is because in an audit, it will show you the depreciation of what the audit is depreciated. And a depreciation number in an audit is what you're supposed to be funding to maintain and take care of the building. That's, and that number is going to come out to be, and they're going to have every single item in there. Okay, and it's not just the, 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 it's not just the building. There, there's other items in there like the um, driver's ed car and some other stuff because you depreciate that over the cost of the year too. So, I mean, when we say that we have fifty thousand dollars in a year, and you know, there's, there's we're trying to be nice here. Um, if last year we put one hundred and fifty thousand dollars towards for this year, this current year, and you've already spent it. Did some work at uh, Woodstock Elementary, new fire alarm system, uh, had some issues at the high school that's been surprises, some sanitary waste lines, stuff like that. Yeah. But, but, we, but we, should be, we should be funding a million two to a million four into capital per year. And if the last three years we've only been putting in, you know, this year 50 coming up on this vote, this current year 150, we're under funding a million to a million two per year. And that could be for the last three or four years or five years. So when, um, you know, we, we can get to the point if we actually funded a million two or a million four, which we had this discussion the other day, was is that that's only going to keep you even today that something else might have done unexpectedly. And it's not catching up on the deferred maintenance. That's correct. And that's where we've got into the conversation that we really need to be putting probably closer to one point. That's why you're saying one, two, one, four to two million. In, in there. And that's in, that's including the deferred payments. Stuff that hasn't been done and neglected yet. Right. And, and I do want to say, and any of you who were on the individual elementary school boards before, I mean, you know, I, what I did for 13 years, I mean, listen, we all know, like, nobody wants to pay 10% more in taxes, right? Everybody wants, like, a 2% increase in the expenses, 2 to 3%. And quite frankly, if you put this money in every year, like, you're not going to be able to offer the same programming and see a 2 to 3% increase. You know, so you end up, you know, you put... We, some some elementary schools were lucky, and we the way we budgeted, we'd always see um, we'd always see a surplus at the end of the year, and, and some of us were able to put that surplus into into maintenance reserves. But you know, I mean, it, there is no there was no ill intent intent on any any school board member. It was you were doing what you you know you, you made fixes that needed to be done at the time the same way all of us, many of us, do in our own homes, right? I mean, you're not necessarily putting, you know, X percent of your replacement costs away, but, um, but certainly, you know, this number to me is very low, the $50,000. So I, um, you know, and I, I would think there's a spot, we'll have to, we'll have to flush this out between a million and a half and two million dollars and putting that in and, and $50,000. Uh, yeah. yeah. I would encourage any any money to go into these potential future projects that we're going to have. Um, I mean, we're we can either pay now or pay later. We're going to pay, and you know it's going to cost more later on. Being in construction, everything costs more than even what Mike's going to tell us. It's imperative that even if we, I don't know. Have to take it out of technology. There's going to come a time where Joe's going to need it, and we're all going to need it because it's either going to mean the school being open or the school being closed. So any any money that you can find in the finance, even if it's half of what Mike's or Joe are suggesting, please put it in there because we are going to need it. Well, it's going to. It's. I mean, it's not going to be. It, it's going to be a discussion we're going to have as a board. You know what. But when we, when we're able to get you know tighter numbers from the state, and we're going to really see what the tax implications are going to be. It's a decision as a board what we're willing to do. Hold on one second, Jimmy. Did I thought Pamela? Uh, I basically you know, feel the same way as Matt. I just I think that I hope that we decide to fund fund that more than fifty thousand dollars. It seems um, it seems like a terrible idea. <laughs> 
And uh, even if it means that we have to do some, so, you know, we have to make our choices. But I don't think that it's a responsible thing to fund a fifty thousand dollars this year. Anybody else? Jeff. So, on capital, if we borrowed money, I don't know. I mean, so if we borrowed a bond for certain repairs on our elementary schools and certain other things while we're waiting on whatever for middle school, high school, is that counting for the per pupil excess spending? That's one. I don't know. It has to get approved. But I, you could, I guess we're doing Robert's rules, so I'm talking yeah. to Jennifer. Um, and then I guess we could reply back after I'm done. Sure. But um, that could be a way, because I know like in the town, we, we, we said that we deferred maintenance because of taxes were going up for whatever reasons. Okay. So we finally got after 17 years of Act 60, we finally got enough into our town to say we have to start taking care of some of our roads. So we borrowed a million dollars for a certain road, we borrowed for a certain road, we borrowed 588,000. Well now in town it's straight out, but if it's the school, and Ben can answer after, we put it for a bond and make it that it's capital and it's approved, then it will not be going towards our per pupil excess spending. It will still raise your taxes. But at the same time, if Joe comes in and says, you know, you know, for me really to get these schools going X amount of more years, I need three million, five million dollars. Well, that three million or five million dollars, if we just put it into our budget for a million dollars or a million five, it, 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 it's crazy. Two hundred thousand dollars will no, change our. It's just crazy yeah. to get there. So, but if we borrow a million or a million and a half and we're getting a low interest rate on it and we spread it out over, you know, 10 or 15 years, it's going to lower down the impact. That's what we have to be looking at. But in order to do that, we need first to find out what exactly is on this battle list, okay, to be done to keep us going. Nobody wants to go into a winter saying, you know, this may fail and I'm not going to get that piece of machinery for three or four weeks because it's a special system. So I mean that's where we should be looking at and I'll leave it to Ben and yeah. Yeah. Sure, it's just yeah. break the rules. Um, the, uh, uh, part of the uh, presentation I gave in October was uh, kind of reporting out on the conversation we had with uh, Brad James from the AOB this summer around um, school construction projects and the approval process. And approved capital construction projects um, <coughs> are not part of your excess spending um, you know, uh, calculation for purposes of the uh, double counting penalty. Now that, that's a, a, a big qualifier in that um, if, as part of that approval process, what we see in the forms is um, you have to make a, a, a declaration in there that this is not deferred maintenance that you're paying for, right? So something you know, comprehensive, big scale, um, you know, uh, that we've uh, currently got big five million bucks um, just earmarked in the, the current new build uh, committee for the, the elementary school projects as part of a comprehensive, you know, plan, um, you know, with the, the approach that we're pursuing at middle school, high school being a new building. Um, but our um, expectation, based on what we're seeing around the state with, you know, renovation work in uh, Burlington, uh, the Slate Valley School District uh, announcing their plans, is that uh, some of those renovation projects could qualify for, um, you know, the, the approval process and exemption from excess spending. So is renovation different than deferred maintenance? Yeah. Well, you'd have, to, you'd have to get into it. Yeah. And determine where it is. I don't know what the answer is. <laughs> yeah, Either yeah. way, you have to look at a bond for deferred maintenance. Either way, it doesn't matter if it goes into, into whatever, it would be great if it doesn't go into the, the excess spending. But, I mean, I'm sorry, this, this is like my biggest thing with this board and this school district. You know, we're trying to do so many great things, but yet the house that we're doing it in is going to fail. And just like if the building fails, all this great stuff that you guys want to do, you don't have a building, you don't have a building to do it. I'm sorry. It's just that's what it is. So, you know, we're a school public education 
system and we should be maintaining our buildings correctly. Well, we will. Um, I, I see your hand. We're not, this is. It's just a clarifying question. A clarifying question, okay. Yeah, two times. Yep. Um, during the last two years, has the Unified District been responsible for maintenance at Barn and Patton? No, no. They've, they've done their own. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Well, this is it's a continuing discussion. I mean, this is like, okay, here it is. <laughs> Here's our first run at it. So um, this is on uh, all of our radars. And uh, I, are, are there any other opinions or voices that aren't sort of echoing what we've already said that, that you want all of us to be, be aware of? Nothing different? I have nothing different. I would, say, I would agree. I think it's the 50,000. Okay. Okay. Understood. Yep. As we as we continue to, to, to develop the budget for fiscal year 21, we'll be able to explain where the costs are coming in at, and then if there's room to add more, of course, we'll add more. We just have to figure out what that equation is, because right now, based on the previous meeting, I think we we're all aware that between the uh, the contractual obligations that we have, both on the salary perspective and the healthcare perspective, we're already at 950. That's a $950,000 increase from last year. Um, and so we're just trying to balance all the different inputs. I think the last topic here is technology. Yep. And the good news is that's um, relatively flat from last year. So I always like to report um, non-increases. Um, and there's actually a possibility for a reduction if the E-rates come through, the E-rate credits that we can get on uh, <coughs> Internet and phone, or just the internet? I can't remember. I think it was just the internet. Just the internet. Just the internet. Um, so, and, and, and RAF um, um, is willing to, to help us with that cause. Uh, he was just afraid to, to model it in the event that we don't. It's not a guarantee that we get this credit. So, we, we wanted to be conservative and not put it into the budget. Okay. So, it could only get better if, if, if things go our way. So, can that be something yep. that you could just kind of roll over into our? previous conversation of building maintenance and that fund. When do you get the E-rate information? It usually comes out in the fall. So next fall? Next it would, fall. Yeah. You see, the problem is but we it, won't yeah. know that till next fall. <coughs> so. We'll get back to you next fall. I'll <laughs> but of course, well, when but we have like that, that, I mean, that would be an obvious choice to, to earmark funds for. I'm sure Joe would be excited. Um, just quickly, so the, the board knows and the community knows, um, one of the things that uh, RAF and his department has done is very similar to Joe's report card at each school um, in terms of facilities. RAF and his team have looked at the technology infrastructure at each school and have created a map in terms of where we are. Um, and places that we need to work. So part of this budget is to continue to chip away at some of these different areas um, to ensure that we have um, strong infrastructure across all of our schools. Um, so this money will enable us to continue to work on the different areas. Um, and again, that there's been a full analysis and we're, and he, Raff and his team are clear in terms of what the work is ahead of us. And if you're looking at a black and white copy, it's better to look on your computer. It, it it's on red and color. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. There's, unless I'm missing it, there's no key to what the colors mean. Yeah. So I don't, okay. I yeah. don't know. So you're right, there isn't. So I think red is Side on red's so bad. Yeah. Red's green bad. is good. Yeah. Green is good. Yellow is good. Yellow is good. Yellow is good. Complex color charts. It was a beautiful job. Do you draw? Okay, so that's, that's what it is, though. Okay. Solid copies cost more. Yeah, that's right. We're trying to save money. We're trying to save money. Okay. Um, okay, any further questions on technology? Okay, next item is the vote on the meal costs for FY21. As you see, I'm, I'm sorry. Motion to approve. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. Uh, discussion is page 11. Uh, you'll see the current prices, FY20, the suggested prices, and then in bold shows the variation and what the increase would be. Um, Gretchen, could you just comment that we have not had a price increase in two years? Is that correct? Um, so, I, Adam's facing I'm sorry? I, I have a high school in my years, and I've had a increase, and then we've been having a 
Okay. So there was some there. How are we like in the state? Um, so again, depending on where you are for your free and reduced rate for your district is sort of where you um, how set are your we with similarly situated districts? Um, so I just sort of looked up. No, I'm not gonna look find it. Um, so adult pricing is pretty much average around the state between 425 and 5. Okay. So that's I'm comfortable with that. Um, and you know they lunch a student lunch price for high school does range anywhere from three to three seventy five. Um, so I think we're at, we were proposing three seventy five. Okay. Um, and again, the high school is our biggest re revenue source, and so that's where we want to make sure that we are um, budgeting correctly and, and, and getting that price to be where it needs to be. Okay. Um, Just out of curiosity, why does high school cost more than elementary? They eat more. Bigger portions. Gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> Just make it sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Those big, like, 17 year old boys and the little kindergarten girls. Okay, got it. Uh, okay. Are there um, some, any more questions for Gretchen about the pricing? I, I don't think this is anything for this board to be really talking about. I mean, it's, it's a suggestion from the food staff. Um, we yep. tie it on, basically, Gretchen has the food staff and the motion on the floor because you just vote for it. Okay. So, motion to approve the uh, suggested prices uh, for um, meal costs for FY21. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Okay, and the ayes have it. Thank you. These go in effect July 1 of May. Correct. Or, yeah, start of school. Oh, yeah, do you, do they feed at summer soap? The, yes, they do. Yeah. And these prices apply at summer soap? July 1. Okay. Yep. Okay, great. Um, okay. Next is uh, a, a re discussion and resolution for adjusting the timing of the annual budget vote. Motion to approve. Okay, second. 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 Okay, so we'll discuss this. Um, we have always, um, as you know, because you've been to your town meetings or you've voted on spending ballot in your towns, we've always um, had our school budget um, votes at town meeting. This proves problematic because the um, we need to really have our budgets, we have to have our budgets to the town, various town clerks between the 20th and 25th of January. Um, there are several um, key pieces of information that we just don't have by that time, and it often, um, yeah, it's, it's just, it's, it's quite problematic. This year we are anticipating, um, sort of really just not having a, a, we're not anticipating having FY19 closed by the time we would have to have our budget into the town clerks. Um, quite troubling, as I said for us on the Finance Committee, not to have 19 closed before you're making your budget for 20. I mean, um, and uh, so this is this is certainly something, it, an additional factor um, that I think is important to consider, but, but I, there's a further discussion why we think this is a good idea going forward, regardless of this year. But you know, certainly, Barnard right now, Barnard has voted to join the district. There will be a vote on town meeting um, from the rest of the towns to accept Barnard. Um, if we had a later vote, uh, you know, we, we, you know we're, at this point we're, we're charging Joe to go forward, I'm, so, I'm sorry, Mike to go forward with two different budgets, Barnard in, Barnard out, but um, you know, there are, there are, just, there are gonna be differences if we have Barnard in or out. So. Um, but I'm interested, I'd like to have the other members of the Finance Committee speak on this, Mike speak on this, Mary Beth, um, you know, about why we think this, this might be a good idea. Before we get questions open, Jim, do you want to comment? Yeah, on sure. This? I mean, I believe that Rob, not Rob, Ron Smith, who is our auditor, basically had a conversation one time with Mike, basically saying that he doesn't understand why 80% of the towns in the state of Vermont actually have the vote before having all the information. You know, this is not just for we have 2019. We don't have 2019 close. This is this is to move forward for every year going forward. You know, the, um, Brad James is you just said he, he, 
he doesn't have the equalized student numbers out. You know, um, it, it's Christmas is next holiday or whatever is next week, okay? So when we get that number next week, we may not be around. Then you need to get um, clarification. We want to verify those numbers because there could be some mistakes in the equalized students. And we just don't have enough time. I mean, I know we have a letter here from one of the town clerks or treasurers, whatever, stating that it would really mess up and it's a cost about $1,000 for each town to do it. Um, I don't see it costing the town. I really do believe that we had a conversation in finance saying, no matter what it costs, this is something else that we should put in. And if it's going to be $1,000, the district should be taking this on, not the towns. So that will take out this argument here. Um, we really, I mean, every year we do a budget. I mean, I've been in finance now for uh, seven or eight years. And Tim, how many times just middle school, high school? You know, we think we have a budget, and then all of a sudden we get thrown a curveball. And the, the numbers change. And the numbers change. So why wouldn't we rather have the numbers that they're not going to change? I'll just give one example. I mean, it, there are lots of different examples. I, I think of the tuition. When we set this, the tuition rate, those of you will remember when we did that, we said, well, we're going to set it. But remember, there's this funny thing, because we set the tuition rate, but then the state will tell us what we're allowed to charge the tuition, but they don't tell us until February. So then, sometimes we have to pay back the towns if we charge them too much tuition. I mean, there are all these variables that happen really in this January, February time frame. It's very funny that that would really help us to make, you know, <coughs> budgeting decisions that um, are not in front of us if we have to do this, you know, before January 20th. So, so, so Jennifer, since it's finance, and I don't have to raise my hand, I guess, I'm going to do it. Um, you know, one of the other perfect examples is that, you know, we just received a letter last week from the VSBA telling us that, the, that, that, that we were going to see a six cent or a six percent, whichever one it was, increase. It gave us all these numbers. And then when the VSBA came out just the other day and said, um, the VSBA or the state of Vermont did not take into account either offer from the insurance. They didn't take into account the what the state was proposing or what the unions were proposing. So, and then they said, they'll get back to us. I mean, that's what the letter says in our, in our emails. So we don't have that. We don't even know what that number is. So how do you make a budget? If you don't know where you stand, um, you know. I, I mean, I think it's a, it's it's a no-brainer. But I made a motion to approve this, and what I really should have done, and I'd like to make an amendment to it, is is that um, one of the other questions here is why would we be waiting to accept Barnard in um, into our town meeting day? I think it would be better if we're going to have a, se a separate vote on this item here, that we should be including that the districts accept or not accept, bonded into. So then I think Bob Green showed us that it was 12 days of warning. So we can get the wording corrected, that we could have that vote there. So then we could have to the state of Vermont that we've actually accepted Bonded in so we can have it counted towards our per pupil. At the later date or when? No, at, at the, the earlier date. We, we have to have a vote, right? Yeah, are, are you suggesting then ostensibly a third vote for citizens? No, this here is a resolution. Oh, yeah. But we, we, we have to, this resolution is stating that we're going to put this out to the voters to approve for moving the day. Oh, I understand. I understand. So, yeah. so, so, this, so in, in, in this resolution, we should be adding also at the same time of having this date for this vote, and we also include an article Barnard, two yeah. into it. So then, so then we have it, and it should be, we should have this vote sometime within the January, late January, early February period, because, or well, really sometime in late January, because there's the 30-day period. 
you know, because even though Bonnet voted in to come into our district, we have to wait for 30 days for nobody to Jimmy, no. are you, I, that's, uh, raise, this is resolution wouldn't go to the voters. No, this is the board making a resolution to move your day you will present your budget for voting to the communities. This is your resolution, not a vote. Yeah, resolution. okay, so, so then that makes me wonder because I sent out the actual statute and it says that a town can move. I sent the, I sent the And does the, do the voters have to move on, vote it on the date? It says that you have to have the vote. In order to move the date, you have to have the vote either a town meeting day or, or a special meeting. It doesn't say that the school board can. I mean, I, I, I sent a specific statute. Um, I'll pull it up here and I'll read it. If it while I'm looking for yeah. somebody is else. There, is there somewhere. some other comment from the board just though on this um, on this idea of having a, a leader vote? Um, so concerns that, about it? Or, yes, I think just the natural question will come from the broader community of why. Yeah. You know, if this is so we have more actual, so we right. have more accurate numbers. Yeah. But if this has been happening statewide for years, it ha but it, twenty percent of towns don't do it at town meeting. Okay. I mean, because for ease, I mean, it's easier just to have it all at town meeting. Um, but the, you know, I mean, it's and I think there's always been a question of accuracy, but there has been uh, been enough. You know, I mean, certainly in Killington, there was some wiggle room. I mean, we always had a surplus, and I wasn't. You know that concerned that, but we have a very tight budget this year, and we do not have a, we do not have an FY19 that's closed. I mean, so I think that has sort of brought it to the forefront where we have had some discomfort in, in asking voters to decide on next year's budget when we haven't seen last year's close. So Jennifer. Yes. Title 16, Chapter 9, 422 meetings, the annual town meeting shall be the annual town school district meeting. However, at any annual or special school district meeting, the electorate may authorize the annual school district meeting to be held on another date so long as the meeting is held after February 1st and before June 15th. So we B, have B, a warning to change the date for the annual school district meeting shall contain an article in substantially the following form. Shall the town school district of hold its annual meeting? C, town school district meeting shall be warned by the school board and shall contain appropriate articles notifying the electric of the election of its offices and the business to be transacted. So, I mean, um, That's really the meeting in March. The district meeting is not voting on the budget. So did we, so, so, so when I sent this over to the, the super, at the SU, Okay, I did clarify, but please make sure. So is this, did we check with council that we can do it and it's done this way? Um, no, we, we did not check with council because we looked at the statutes and we didn't think that it was, it was necessary. The statute discusses the annual district meeting. That's your meeting where you elect your, where you set, where we all go to the high school, sit in there, vote every, so so, so, that, so, so, that, so so basically, the, and that's what I had said, I, I found something that stated a statute, I sent it over, I wanted it to be confirmed, but so if it says, if the statute says that we can change that vote, where does it say that we can change the actual town vote? And that's, and that's why I think we need to go ahead. I mean, I would, I, I, reading that, I thought it was this vote, and I would love us to move the date, but I would want to make sure that we can check with council. If council says that we can yeah. move the vote. We can do that. I, this needs to, we'll, we'll check it with council um, and then come back if we, have to, if we have to do a special meeting. Or ask Ron Smith how the other districts have, other districts have done it. Well, we well, can check with council. If you want to do a motion where if we confirm with council, this is so I'll make my. We can do that. Yes, yeah. if I'll we confirm with council that we're able to do that. Um, what are some other people's uh, concerns or input on this? Oh, I'm sorry. Just, uh, that's my notes. Um, uh, just how far do we feel we have to push this vote out? We were thinking the, the first Tuesday in April. First Tuesday. Is that enough time? I don't think you want to go any later. I mean, you don't want to go into April break, and then you don't. 
No, I don't, I don't, I'm not comfortable going any later than that because if it doesn't pass, you need time to make adjustments to it. So I mean, you can't be doing that in May to do the adjustments for June and have a vote. You know, I mean, I think we will. Um, do you, you said that you need to have, if we were going to do it at the regular time, we need time, you need to have the information to the towns January 20th. So how? 20th to 25th, is somewhere so in that window. If we move it to the first during the second Tuesday, when do you have to have well, the information? When would it would, have to what, what, what needs to go to the towns is basically, um, they, you know, there's town meeting, your, town report. your annual report. So the information goes into that annual report. The publishing date is sometime that third week in um, January. What would happen is, in the town report, would go reports from the principals, reports from the superintendent, and they would be they would be more focused on the you know on the programming and things that are going on at the school, like a sort of year end report. But then what would happen is the same thing that happens anyway. We we'll publish sort of you know, much more detailed line by line budgetary um, analysis that goes into the new local newspapers. We paid, or I think the papers helped us pay last year, right? You know, give us a discount, right? whatever. So anyway, we published this, you know, newspaper um, thing that every, all the voters get or anybody who buys a paper gets. Plus we have them at the town hall and we have them at, you know, accessible places for people. We would still put that together. We'd just be able to put it together later. It's not going to be in the town report. It's not going to be, the numbers are not going to be in the town report. <coughs> yes. It, it, it hasn't been in the town report, it, uh, at least in the last couple of years. Yeah. We're linked to the information. And like you said, we're looking at just the reports around programming. Um, you had indicated that if we go forward with this, that there'd be a letter from the board chairs explaining, yeah. explaining why we would be moving this. the date. And then the other thing that would go into the annual town reports are the articles for the, for the barn and merger vote. Um, yeah, the thing that I want to add to this conversation is just um, the sort of processing what Jim said about maybe the possibility of an earlier vote because Corinne and I were talking the other day, Corinne Parkman were talking the other day and realizing that both entities will have to vote on contingent um, budget. budgets. And we, I guess we hadn't realized that. We were like, wait, what are we voting on that town meeting day? And we're not in yet, so we can't really vote, you know, we don't have. So anyway, it's just awkward that, that we'll have to all be voting on budgets that are contingent, which means we'll all have to keep on doing two budgets. And um, so if there were a way to, um, in this process to move forward earlier, probably be yeah, definitely better, cleaner, mm -hmm. easier. Mm -hmm. But the, the timeline, even if we, let's say we can do this today, <coughs> right? Where the board just where the board just, just moves it. it. We still need then to have a separate vote for barn then for the rest of the district to accept it. So if we could get that vote off by. January something. At least we should do that. Even if we can't do this other thing, then at least we should be getting the January vote in for accepting bond or not. It would have to be after January and, and 10th for consideration, reconsideration. Right. So then if, if, you, if, if, if it was after January 10th, let's say it was January 15th or whatever, then you have to give it 30 days for that, whatever. So now you're at February, okay, 15th. So no matter what, you still got to move forward with the two budgets, just in case of remote. But it will be giving the state the answer that we need them to have, so we get the right equalized students for. Mm -hmm. What are people's thoughts? Yeah. I think it makes a lot of sense to me. We want to make sure that. that yeah. I'm asking what we think about adding a vote All for Barnard. And I guess one concern. Yeah, don't. What, asking for something. Yeah, no, I guess one concern I've got, and who knows how the budget's going to play out, and the decision on the timing of a, uh, a bond vote on uh, school construction initiatives is just, you know, we've talked about bond fatigue. I wonder if we, you know, call people out for a vote on Barnard, then a vote at town meeting, then a vote on the budget, and then we're going to do a fourth one for a bond. Yeah, it seems. Seems like a lot. Um, so just since it's still going through with finance, 
if we don't have the vote for accepting Barnard before the state does all their numbers, then we're looking at a equalized student. Mike, we have like 836 students, I believe, this current year as equalized students in our district. I actually have some preliminary data. Okay, so what, what is 850, it? 851 could be the number. 851, is that including Barnard or no? no. So <coughs> Barnard 7 through 12, but not the K, pre K. Right, so mm -hmm. 8, 851 is the number, okay? Preliminary, and, though. And, and it's preliminary, but the state has already set three weeks ago the excess per pupil spending number for 2021 at 18,756. So if you take the 851 and you times that by the 18,756, it means you have a budget that you can have 15,961,356. Mm. So if we're already at 15, <laughs> if we're already at 15 million dollars for this current budget, okay, and we're already looking at a million dollars for compensation and uh, for for um, committed. Yeah. Funds yeah. that we have no yeah. contractual, contractual agreements. <coughs> you know, we're already over the fifteen nine sixty one. Yeah. So, but if you if you can if you if you add that fifteen nine sixty one, and let's say Barnard is a million two hundred to run for for the budget, you know, give them that. Okay, we're at seventeen million one sixty one, but Barnard has about eighty. Is it, is it 80? 79, but I don't know. That's actual. I don't know what so, the... So, so, so what Barnard's reporting is in like the 79 number, but, but the problem is uh, I'm looking at data that I don't think is right. Okay, but so, so, so let's, say, let's, say it's, let's say we have 851 and Barnard has 60, okay? So 851 uh, and 61, we're putting ourselves up to what? 851 and 911, right? So right around there, so you're dividing that by 911, you know, that's putting me at 18,837 per child. If, 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 if we don't, we're going to be into the $19,000 per whatever. I mean, we really need We need Barnett's numbers in, absolutely. Here, because Barnett will stop lower the per pupil spending. Yeah, I, I, I personally would love to see a vote to, to from the other community to, to put them in. Yes, so that we do one budget and we can merge the SU in so that there's no like, multiple budgets. One budget for, for the entire district and it's presented to the community. That would make things that, that, that would be, we would have We would have the vote. We would have the answer of the vote of the district. That's not making your job easier because you still have to do the two budgets. Okay. But when we finally put it to forward, yep. At the at whatever date, or whenever. it will only have one budget. Yeah, it'll be, it'll be clean. Is my point. It'll be clean. But less, yeah. less I do understand. I do understand your your point, then, but I I think it's that we need to know about those partner kids to be able to count. You know, what what are other what are your just your to, just to you know remembering this letter from the from the town. I know. I know. They, I know. They would, I know. But but but. We said we would take that on. We have it more than once. This is a one. This is a one. Really, this is a one-time deal for Barnard. You know, I mean, this is a one-year thing. Uh, other yes. So uh, I guess, which I guess maybe this falls under kind of what I was saying. Multiple times, asking multiple people to come out multiple times. Yeah. I question whether or not you're going to get. A lot of people to come out. I mean, I think that you collect a lot of votes on town meeting day because it's town meeting day and that's what it's on everybody's mind. You have them spread out <coughs> in a few months. I, I wonder if anybody will actually show up. That would be my concern. It's valid. I guess my, my retort to that would be, oh, well, I'd rather, well. no, 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 not that, but I'd rather have accurate information that people are voting on than to get, you know, and, and who, who, I hope that people would sure. care enough to come and vote, but, you know, the, I, I would rather people have be voting on accurate information. Me too. Because yeah. accurate information and potentially a more beneficial budget to, to them sure. as well. And that, I think that falls, it's going to fall greatly on you guys to really get people out. Yeah, that out. It's going to be very All important. three votes. And, it, and it's, 
It's a very unique year. Yeah, it's unique something we're going to do every year. This is a very unique year in many ways. And it's going to be difficult for everybody. Possibly four votes if it needs to be done by the electorate. If moving it needs to be done. Yeah. You know, and I, and I guess I, I just look at Barnard's record of now voting. I mean, they had maybe like 200 people come out and yeah. 700 registered voters in the oh, town. I think that's how all of our towns are. Okay. I mean. Okay. Um, okay, so I, I would take back from this that um, I, I think what we could do, though, is if, um, we need to get information. I mean, that's the, yes. If you voted to before well, the resolution is on. I, I amended my account. motion to say yeah. that Mary Bath is a superintendent as the group, as long as it's legitimate, mm -hmm. that we can move forward. And I believe then I uh, seconded it to make it go through. And that's just on the resolution. Yes. Thank you. So, okay. All those in favor of the motion on the table? Aye. 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 All those opposed? And then the next part is, is that I think we should find out about mm -hmm. what's going to be better for us with the Barnard. Yeah. If, if we have to have that other, if, if it can't be a resolution or it has to be a town vote, then I think we need to Then we would do get together. Together. go yeah. both together. So there wouldn't be a thing. I mean, there wouldn't be a thing. Yes. Do we need to vote on taking on that $1,000? Um, that Jim mentioned, so what do you think? Taking on the cost of what these do additional... Do we have to vote on that, or is that just what they vote? Um, or, dis or discuss, or we can discuss the next is it? Or well, no, I mean, I think that's valid. Is You know, I mean, I, I, I think it's appropriate. Um, it's a thousand for town, it's a, so. Or, you know, it's a thousand for Woodstock. We don't have exact numbers for each town. What it would be to it's about a thousand dollars for each town. No matter okay. what we talk to, it's going to say it's a thousand dollars. But we 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 made a motion. Yeah. Second, we had discussion. I brought in the letter. I, I mentioned the letter. I mentioned to everybody who knew about the thousand dollar cost that it would take, and we just all voted yes. Yeah. I mean. I, I, what else we're talking yeah, about? Yeah, no, for this one, but I mean, if we do, you know, there, if, if we bring this forward for Barnard as well, there could de there will be additional costs um, to the district, at least for this year for Barnard and, you know, for this potentially going forward. So it's yeah, valid to anybody have anything else you'd like to say about that? Where's the money coming from? <laughs> the $50,000. <laughs> 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 Where it's been coming from, yeah, yeah. Take it away. Yes, but I think that's a nice gesture. I also wonder, is it necessary? I just don't know enough about the town government to understand. Is that you know, are there other circumstances where we have special votes, and how is that usually funded? Are we already in the town budgets? Is it already? Jim, as a select <coughs> member, I ask you. I don't really know. I just don't know. Is it already? Expected that that's part of the job. Do you think that's expected that we would be expected like, to pay this? Most, most select boards, are, if they know there's an issue coming up and there's a special vote in that upcoming year, they budget it for it. You know, I mean, I, I think this is going to come into a community thing that, you know, here we are finding out if we're going to have this vote and then coming back and saying, you know, if we put this cost into or whatever. It's going to affect the per pupil cost, which in the end is going to raise your education tax rate. Can the town take it over? And I would tell you that in our, just like the generator, we took the full thirty-five thousand dollars over instead of school. Yeah, I mean, it, school. it makes sense for towns to pay for this, not for the district to pay for it, because it's <coughs> per pupil spending. You know, so um, again, I think it's a nice gesture. It almost sounds, but I just wonder: is that money already already? There. And, uh, they, well, I mean, you know what I mean, the town is going to say the same exact thing that we say well, most of the time, too. We'll find it somewhere. Right. <coughs> you know. Or do we stop it? So, of course, I don't know. I'm just throwing it out there as a um, researchable subject. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I think that it, it's putting, as this letter attests to, um, quite a burden. Yeah. And this is coming mm -hmm. from the clerk of the largest town. I mean, some of the towns, it's a really small, in Barnard, it's yeah. a really small operation. Yeah. You know, it's like three days a week, five hours a day, like yeah. very small yeah. staff. So um, I, I, I just, 
I think that we should offer to pay for it because it just seems like a huge ask, like a, an unreasonable ask of our small little town offices. I agree 100% with you. I just think that we voted on it. It's going through. We're going to find out. And then it's going to be up to each individual town to decide which way they're going to do it. And some towns might say that, you know, if this is going to put us into a penalty phase or whatever, that it's, it's beneficial to our taxpayers in the end to, to just pay the $1,000 instead of charging the taxpayers maybe $10,000. I, I don't know, but we have to find out what the real number is. And, and this is only going to get us what the budget is, and that's why. So. But some towns might say, we can't do this, we're not doing it. But, 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 then so. the, but then the school district will do it for that. Yeah, I'm just saying. And, and then it's going to get spread amongst all the towns anyway. So, so is like it a Robin Peter to pay Paul, I guess? Is the well, thing. so do you suggest that, that, um, I mean, that this is a, a conversation for Mike slash Mary Beth with, the, with each town clerk as we ask them, like, because I'm with you, I think I think Killington will say we'll pay for it as a town because it doesn't make any sense to put that in. But I, I, I don't know. The bigger question is, is the Woodstock guys, and then, and then on the bonnet part, I think that you know, I think that we should go to each town. We have a meeting tomorrow. I will bring it up. And just clarifying when, because we can reach out to the different towns to let them know this is the conversation we're having. This is why we're trying to do it, let them know the economic benefit of doing it. But when do, would we want to identify a vote for Barnard? Because I'm sure that would be something they would want to know. We talked about doing it after January 15th, right? That gets us past 30 days. The, yeah. I mean, I think that's up to this board, right? Yeah, so if you, I mean, it, it's kind of pick a date. But that way I can, when we reach out to folks, we can let them know when we're anticipating doing it. What day of the week is? January 15th is a Wednesday. That sounds like a good day. It's the week we before. So we can do it on Jan. Why don't we do it January 14th? Um, you have to do your morning for a minimum of 30 minutes. Yeah. Okay. So we have oh, to so from it, January 15th, then we can start our 30 days. January 10th. Oh, January 10th. Okay, then we can start oh, so our 30-day morning. morning. Not till February. Not till mid-end of February. You might as well wait till March 3rd. Yeah. If you're only looking at a week or two, you'll get more of a turnout on March 3rd. Yeah. So then the issue, I get it all, but the issue that is, that's going to bring up, and then maybe this is discussion with Mike, just like, the high school was in um, excess spending, and there was no statute to stop. But we should have. But the elementary schools were lower, and when they averaged the two out, it they allowed us, and that was a verbal agreement between RSU and the AOE, correct? So maybe we should be also talking to the AOE and saying, if in the March vote that Barnard agrees to come over, will you the be willing to, to, agree to take yeah, Barnard, yeah. The towns will, will you be willing to change to include the equalized yes. students? Because yes. if it's the way it is right now, you know, we're just going to have our 851, okay? Um, that's a good point. I mean, that yeah. seems that's to be a really that's important the conversation. conversation. You know, so, yeah. I mean, so we have to start the conversation with Brad James that, and, and I spoke to Brad today, and when I told him I, I wanted the excess spending number, if it went out, he told me what it was. He told me that the other number is coming out next week, hopefully. He's like a week behind. Um, and then I said, well, it's really important to me because Barnett voted to come into. And he was, wow, really? And I said, yeah, Brad, they voted to come in. He says, oh, that's really good because I'm starting to work on this equalized number. Mm -hmm. So maybe he's willing to work uh, yeah, with can, us. That, that's a great <coughs> idea. That is a really yeah. important idea because I, it's, it's, it is more than probable, I would think, that everybody's going to accept Barnard in. So like, we should be making these plans. Um, well, I would want to say to anybody that's watching this on TV, when well, oh, we yeah. have this vote, yeah. <laughs> we need Barnard students to come yeah. in for equalized count. It should, it should be an automatic yes vote. Okay. So, <laughs> all 
Okay, so um, this resolution is passed. Mary Beth will look into this. Uh, we've also charged Mike and Mary Beth. We've, we've talked to Brad, Brad, Brad James yeah. about this. Um, and I think at this point, then, let's see if you can talk to him because it's true if we can't have that vote till the middle of February. Anyway, there's no reason to have a separate vote two weeks, <coughs> two weeks before town meeting. So, um, okay. Uh, next, we're going to vote on another vote, which is the uh, school high school choice limit number. Uh, we've now talked approve. about this for two meetings. Motion to approve the... Um, well, I, don't, I don't know if we, we have a page number, so... Just approve it. Uh, so we want to make a motion to number right now, a reminder that we have 10 high school choice students. We did not take any in. Freshman year. Uh, so my motion is to approve six for this upcoming year. What do you mean by that? Six total students? Six total students. And then grandfather and any students. Is that, that's, yeah. or is, that, it, is that total, Jim? Total. Total. And that grandfather's in. So basically, I don't have the yeah, number. I'm sorry for my. <coughs> we have 10 currently right now, and there are four and 12 four. grades. Okay. We have a recommendation in front of us of anywhere from five to ten. I mean, that's my motion. I you know, yep. nobody seconded. Um, second. Okay, discussion. I just want to remind. I think that the number before it was ten. It was somewhere in the five to six range. Does that sound right? Is it? Um, I think school? around four years ago we were at five. Five. Yeah. Clear. I'm just wondering if you heard that. That's what yeah, I mean, we, we've looked at that, and we it, it isn't something that's super clear cut. But when we we look at the different perspectives of it, I think any number between five and ten makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the things that can happen with this is that we we are taking in far more students that that are leaving. Um, and one of the things that we sometimes see are, are families that may choose to purchase a home in a different district, you know, it's figuring that, okay, I'll go in through school choice. Um, and that's, that's kind of a counter, um, a, a counter approach to what we're trying to do to bring students into our district. So if, I, if I'm offering a recommendation at all, it would be kind of leaning more to the lower end because of that. Any other discussion beyond the number six? So that would essentially mean that uh, right. we wouldn't take any new students next year as well, and then we would be open to taking new students after that. Okay? Okay. Uh, all those in favor of the motion on the table? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay, the ayes have it. <coughs> six new students. Um, Okay, Mike, you're back up here. Mike. Okay, uh, so Mike is going to give us a little bit of background um, on what's going on with the FY18 audit report and the 19. Um. Oh, okay. sorry. You, you wanted to discuss the 18, please? Sure. Sure, I don't know. You can decide. Lovely. Lovely. Yeah, so 18, I know it seems like a, a long time ago. Um, I guess um, the best way I can explain this is when I came aboard in September, there were some open items on the 18 audit that were small in nature, uh, that had to do with some of the terminology and, and how the, um, the auditors were writing up the report. And so we try to finalize the wording on these reports, and the majority are done. There are uh, three, however, that we're still waiting on completed final acceptances on. And one is the high school, the other is the SU, and I think the other one was Pittsfield. Prosper Valley. No. Prosper Valley, thank you. And so those three, I'm working to get the final, 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 final version of. Um, and so that's that's forthcoming. Um, and that will, um, and that information is, is with us here at the central office. So if anyone's interested in seeing their particular town and the audit results, um, come on over. I'll give you something to take home and help you fall asleep. All right. So with 19, are we ready to move on to 19? Yeah, 19. Okay. So with 19, um, as as Jennifer has been alluding to, unfortunately, 19 is not yet closed. There are lots of things that need to be done. 
um, some of the things that weren't done um, were, were, you know, to not to, to put fault on anyone because we had some system issues uh, that were challenging, like with our third party administrator, DataPath, and the HRA, uh, thousands of transactions that weren't matching up to what was coming in our bank account versus these lovely reports they kept giving us. And so that work wasn't done from a, um, a journal entry and reconciliation standpoint. So it's just, this is nothing, the, the, the building's not on fire. There's nothing earth shattering that I'm explaining here. It's just, there's work to be done. And it's, it's laborious and it's, it's a lot of hours of bread work and journal entries and account reconciliations. Um, the, the good news is, you know, we will get there. It's just taking time. And that time is preventing the auditors from coming out and, and, and doing the audit. There's no sense of coming out to do an audit if, if the work's not complete. That's just a waste of, of our money. So, that's what I've been working so Ron, on. Ron Smith came last uh, Monday, right? Sorry, he came Monday, yep. It, it actually, Ron sent two of his top uh, uh, lieutenants to come see us. And Ron's a busy man. He, he brought out an, an audit partner from principal and a, an audit manager. And um, they gave some good guidance explain what their expectations were before they would come back out again to come visit us and to start performing the audit. And so um, Jane Flynn, who I'm very pleased to say has been working her tail off um, and getting a lot of these journal entries in, along with other team members, Julie Stevens, etc. So we're making great progress. When exactly we'll be ready for the auditors, I don't quite know. It could be later this week for them to come back out and then they'll help us with the account reconciliation to at least get us started. Uh, once all the data entry is into our ERP system. And so the thought is three weeks, four weeks of work, what, any idea? Um, being new to the institution, yep. and have not gone through a close yet, I'm, I'm afraid to give you yeah. a time frame, but I'm assuming a few what weeks. What do they say? I mean, yeah, I think they think within a few weeks we should be um, ready for the audit. Okay. And, and so the audit's only going to take one business week from years past. Okay. Um, so, so we just have to get ready for it. We'll right, get ready for it. Right. And so we'll maybe we'll look at that maybe early January with them to complete the audit. Um, if all things go well. I mean, we, we have some holidays. I'd, I'd like to spend some time with my family. So, you know, I just, I'm just saying that you I... They have Christmas Day yeah. off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. What was the play on Sunday? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> what was the play on Sunday? Ebenezer <laughs> says... <laughs> committed to the cause. I know it's at stake, and I have a sense of urgency, believe me. Um, but I'm also trying to balance making sure I, I don't fall asleep at the wheel at night. Yep. So, um, I'm just doing the best I can. This is your first experience. So just, yeah. uh, and I'm a newbie. I'm we a newbie. knew that coming in. Yeah. I did. No, I did. Yeah. No, no, we, we knew oh, it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it is. You know, I'm learning a lot. The growth of her has been steep, but um, every day I'm learning more and more, and it is getting easier to understand what I'm doing. It's just um, this challenge of the data reconciliation. It's just tough. And we'll get to it. Do you anticipate, you know, are, are you making changes um, in your department so that we are not going to be having the same conversation next fall? Oh, yeah. What? Like, what, like what's happening that it wasn't happening before? Sure. Um, well, I'll, I'll give you a perfect example. So we had a, a high-powered CPA previously in the seat that we have uh, in the accounting and grants manager position. And she was spending over an hour a day, an example, uh, counting cash from uh, the lunch proceeds that would come in. At that particular example, that's not probably a good use of her particular skill set, right? That would be better suited for an individual that had some a different capacity, a different bandwidth, a different skill set to count the cash and checks. So that's an example where Jane's not doing that anymore. We've taken that off of her plate um, and we checked with the auditors and, and then we were the only school district that had a, an accounting person recounting the money already done uh, by the uh, cashiers at the individual schools. So again, it's probably not a good use of time. So we're, we're reallocating who does what and when they do it and uh, Jane's already uh, done uh, all the journal entries that weren't done in fiscal year 20, the year we're in. So she caught up on four months worth of journal entries on the capture seat side, and now she's attacking all of 19, and all we have left, I believe, on the docket is uh, food service capture seats left to play. So we're making great progress. Uh, and how is the um, 
you know, because it seems to me that the part that's been lagging has been the revenue side. Yep. How are we doing in billing, billing district? I mean, how are we doing in getting money in? Sure. Yeah, so uh, tuition invoicing has been done uh, for non-special education. I'm working very closely with Sherry uh, to get making sure that the um, special education tuition invoicing is completed. Uh, then there's also the exercise of, of um, drawing down the grant expenditures. As we spend money, we're allowed to draw down those funds. As soon as I get through the budget cycle, um, I'll start you know, doing that part of the process. Cash got a little bit tight around you know, um, November-ish, but then through the help of many of the towns, the town clerks really stepped up, many of them did, and sent their tax funds in early, which relieved some of that pressure at the end of November. So I, I was really impressed with the community the way people stepped up knowing we needed a little bit of help and they didn't have to take their 30 days to submit the cash they understood where we were at and they were more than willing to help us so that was pretty impressive okay anything else we need to know no i'm, I'm doing the best i can i appreciate everyone's patience okay. thank you for your work so Jennifer, yes after we go through the collections for 10 minutes yeah i'd like to go into executive session for personnel and contracts that here. Okay. Okay. Um, so. With Mike coming in. With Mike coming in. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, and, and, <coughs> okay. I lost my pen somewhere. Did oh. Have my pen? <laughs> there it is. There. Sorry. Okay, got it. It, it. Like it always happens. Like when you sign something, you're like, okay, sure, you can use my pen. Yeah. Um, okay. That's fine, Jim. Okay. So let's um, have a little bit of reflection on the meeting tonight. Anybody uh, have suggestions, comments? Yes, Matt? Maybe you didn't have your hand raised. Just no, she just, just looks at me. <laughs> she knows. Um, no, everybody's very cordial to each other. It's very nice. That's the substance of anything else. Yes. I was just going to say, it kind of broke down tonight, right, um, but kind of in a good way. There was a lot of things that we kind of needed Jim's help on, and he was able to pull us through some difficult subjects that really wouldn't have worked in parliamentary procedure and following the rules yeah. strictly, but we were all very civil, and I think we kind of did well with it. Yep. Claire? I think it was one of the things that was really helpful was Jim's presentation tonight. Maybe what we do, sort of, you know, um, with the idea that it, it's hard to have them all here at every meeting, but maybe with the idea that every other meeting, we, you know, we want people here we and can look at the agenda, agenda and make sure that it's our meeting. Yeah. Sure. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Yep, Jim. I think it was great that we had on the need scheduled appointments and you broke out while we we're in the budget the individual um, groups, and I think we should continue that with the other groups that come forward, yeah. and that's going to invite these people. We really don't need to see John and Mike every yeah. time, but you know, yeah. when it gets into the other items, I would like to see whoever's budget that is, that they come to us and present. Yeah, no, I agree. Other reflections? Suggestions? Executive session. Okay. Um, with who's staying? Mike and Joe. Just Mike and Joe, not Mary Beth. Oh no, she's not yeah. part of it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you're saying yes. Yeah. Okay, so Mike and Mike and Joe and. Thank you, everybody, for coming. We appreciate it.